In the last lecture, we looked at the concept of the root locus, which is basically this idea that you can trace out the trajectory of the closed loop poles uh, in the S-plane as a function of increasing one of the gain parameters in your controller. So we looked at for some function of some gain controller, right? so this is your control gain, how do the closed loop poles uh, actually move around in the S-plane? What we found is we can actually use some design tools or some analysis tools to essentially sketch out what the trajectory of those closed loop poles will ultimately look like, right? And the idea here is that the idea here is that you're looking at the actual closed loop pole locations as a function of increasing one of those gain parameters in your controller itself. In other words, if k is small, if your gain is actually a small value, then along these branches of the root locus, your poles might be here, here, and say here. But as your k gets larger, as k gets larger, these poles actually traverse along these branches in the direction indicated by the arrows. So for a larger value of k, your poles may have moved to here and here and here, for example. Uh, most of last lecture was dedicated to um, developing and applying six rules that allow us to sketch the root locus plot without having to actually make a table of an infinite number of pole values for an infinite number of k values. Um, so rules 0 through 6, I'm sorry, rules 0 through 5, is ultimately six rules, allowed us to come up with the root locus diagram um, in a more straightforward way. Okay, uh, the idea behind today's lecture is we're going to actually use this concept to see if we can um, to see if we can use the root locus idea to do some controller design. Okay, so let's see if we can't come up with um, some applications of the concept of the root locus and, uh, and apply it to designing an actual controller uh, for a feedback system. Okay, so what we're trying to do is essentially design a controller um, to satisfy some criteria. Okay, so some of our design criteria, the most, uh, the most obvious one is such that the closed loop system remains stable, um, but we also want to satisfy uh, a time domain specification uh, given here. So this time domain specification along with the fact that we have a stable closed loop system. Those are, our uh, those are our design criteria. And the question here is, what do we put inside of this transfer function such that the closed loop system behaves in a desirable manner? Um, so we're, we're kind of mixing a few topics here. Uh, we're, we're bringing stuff from previous lectures, like the idea of stability, the idea of satisfying a time domain specification, along with the idea of closed loop control and the root locus concepts into sort of one big design example. Okay, and the idea here is, of course, uh, what goes in here, right? What, what goes in the controller transfer function so that we satisfy all of these items in the specification? Um, as we know, the closed loop poles um, and poles in general dictate the behavior of the particular system. So it's very important that we have a, a strong grasp on essentially where our poles need to be in order to satisfy the specification. So that's probably the first thing we need to do is essentially translate all of this design criteria into um, a desired pole region in the S-plane such that if we place our closed loop poles in that region, we will satisfy the specification.
for the stability criteria, that's pretty straightforward. We just want all of our poles. We just want all of our poles to be in the, uh, the left half plane. Right? That's really all we need. We just need our left, uh, we just need all of our closed loop poles to be to the left of the imaginary axis. And if we can achieve that, then by default, we'll have satisfied the stability criteria. The time domain specification, we have some equations for that uh, from a previous lecture, which will allow us to sketch out sort of a desired pole boundary uh, in the S plane. So applying those equations, we have the following criteria. And then for the rise time specification, we have the following. Okay, so for the For the overshoot specification, we've got a criteria on beta, which is the angle measured from the uh, imaginary axis. And for the rise time specification, we have the criteria on omega n, or the distance from the origin. Um, so putting this stuff together, we can find that our desired pole region falls somewhere in this range. So our desired pole region has got to be here. So this is our S plane. Uh, we need closed loop poles to fall outside of about 30 degrees. And our omega n needs to be larger than a radius of 3. So this would be negative 3 right there. Okay, so our actual actual desired pole boundary would be this boundary here. And so if our poles are in this shaded region here, we will actually satisfy all the elements of our uh, criteria because if we're in this sort of odd shaped region here, by default, we're already to the left of the imaginary axis and thereby stable as well. So this is our desired pole region, anywhere in this shaded area. <clears throat> now, from a control design standpoint, um, it would be nice to see uh, if there were some picture, perhaps, that would tell us where the closed loop poles are actually going to be in the S-plane as a function of increasing one of our gain parameters. Uh, and, and you may see where I'm going here, but if we were to actually sketch the root locus and superimpose it on top of this desired pole region, we could see if the branches of the root locus ever enter the desired pole region, and if so, for what values of k uh, does that occur? Okay, so the first step would be to choose some form of a controller and sketch the root locus and see if it's going to be feasible. Notice that in the problem statement, the form of the controller was not given. Generally, in, in past problems, I've said, you know, find all the values of k such that the following closed loop system remains stable, but, but I would have given you a form of the controller. You know, in other words, c might have been something like k over s, or just k by itself, or some other type of, you know, control. I would have given you the form of the controller. Uh, in practice, that's never the case. Nobody's going to hand you a form of the controller and say, you just need to figure out the values of K to satisfy the objectives. Uh, in practice, nobody will tell you what the form of the controller is. So it's kind of up to you to figure out what goes in that controller. As with most things in engineering, it makes the most sense to start simple. Okay, so we'll try a proportional control. Right, so try proportional control. 
which is basically just a gain, k, right? So the control itself is just a value, a scalar value. <clears throat> and remember to sketch the root locus for this particular controller, we need to plug into the characteristic function. So one plus CP equals zero. That's our characteristic equation. Um, and our plant and our controller are now defined. So we have one plus C, which is just K, times the plant itself, which was one over S times S plus one from above. This was the same plant that we defined up here. And the question now is, is this in the proper form to apply the rules of the root locus? In other words, does this look like it's in the form of one plus K times a bunch of other stuff? Is it in that form? And the answer is yes, because it's uh, the K was um, able to be factored out of this bracketed term. So it turns out that the L of S that we want to apply the rules of the root locus to or is actually just the plant itself. Okay, so L of S is equal to one over S times S plus one. And this is gonna be the starting point for the root locus. Okay, we always have to determine the proper L of S before we can apply the rules of the root locus. Okay, so given this L of S, um, it's always smart to write down a few things right away just things that we know that are very simple to write down to keep ourselves organized. There are n equals two poles, right? Uh, the poles themselves are P1, there's one at the origin, and there's one at negative one. The number of zeros is zero. There are no zeros because it's just a constant value in the numerator, okay? What's also useful sometimes is even the quantity n minus m. And in that case, n minus m equals 2. Okay. okay, so to sketch this root locus, what we can do is start going down through our rules. Okay. Go through rule 0, rule 1, rule 2. Um, those initial three rules give a pretty general sense for how the root locus is going to look. In other words, rule zero says that it, the root locus has to be symmetric about the real axis. Um, and that's, of course, because complex poles always come in conjugate pairs. Um, rule one says uh, essentially how many branches there are and how many of them terminate at the zeros and how many of them shoot off in, to infinity. Um, rule two tells us what part of the real axis is going to be included uh, in the root locus. Okay, so the, the very first thing we may want to do to start our root locus plot is to actually just plot our poles and zeros of L of S. Okay, so for this problem, we have, uh, okay, for this problem, we have a pole at the origin. So there's P1 at the origin. There's a pole at negative one. And that's P2. Okay, so, okay. Okay. Okay, so we've got our, uh, our poles plotted of L of S. Um, the next thing we might consider doing is actually jumping to rule two. Uh, rule two will tell us what part of the real axis <clears throat> um, we can actually sketch right away. Um, so we can actually sketch some portion of the root locus right away. Um, Rule two says essentially to follow this vertical line test. And so uh, the, the rule says that, um, that, you know, the part of the real axis uh, that's included on the root locus is such that if you're standing at that point, you would be to the left of an odd number of poles and zeros. Okay, so if we did the vertical line test, just for sort of some recap, way out here, okay, if I imagine that I'm standing here at this point and sort of looking down at the real axis, I can see that I am to the left of nothing. There are no poles and zeros to the right of me. So I am to the left of zero poles and zeros. 
And the implication there is that zero is not an odd number, and therefore that little point on the real axis there is not considered to be part of the root locus. By contrast, if we then scoot this vertical line in a little bit more to the left, say between these two poles, anywhere between the pole at the origin and negative one, I can say that I am to the left of one pole. One is an odd number, and therefore everything between the pole at the origin and the pole at negative one should be considered to be part of the root locus. Of course, once I sort of exit, or once I sort of exit all of the poles and I'm to the left of both of the poles, I'm now to the left of two poles. And two, again, is not an odd number, so no portion of the real axis to the left of negative one should be part of the root locus. <clears throat> so what I take away from this is that I ought to be able to sketch or shade this region in. And I know for a fact that all of that portion of the real axis is going to be part of the root locus. Okay. Now, according to rule one, um, according to rule one, there are this many branches, so n branches, right? because the branch of the root locus always start at the poles of L. Um, there are two branches. There are no zeros. So none of the branches are going to terminate at the zeros because there aren't any. Uh, what this means is that this many branches, n minus m, two branches are going to approach infinity. And if you recall, rule three tells us how the branches that approach infinity um, approach infinity. In other words, it, it defines these asymptotes that tell us how the branches kind of shoot off to infinity. Um, okay, so what's important here is that uh, we compute alpha. Alpha is the origination point in rule three for the asymptotes. So alpha is basically the sum of all the poles, which is zero minus one, minus the sum of all the zeros, which there aren't any, so it's zero, divided by n minus m. So we get minus one half. So alpha is right here on the real axis at negative one half. And it's important for you to label all of these on your root locus plots as you draw them uh, so that I know that you know uh, what you're doing. Okay, um, if you recall from last lecture also, the case where n minus m equals 2, that's going to produce two uh, asymptotes. And they're going to be defined by the angles pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. So I'll let you review those notes. Uh, there's an example where we computed both of those. Um, and remember, the angles for rule 3 are only dependent upon the, the parameter n minus m. So anytime n minus m is equal to 2, you're going to get two asymptotes, one at pi over 2, one at 3 pi over 2. The only thing that changes, of course, is the alpha, um, which is where those asymptotes begin. Okay, so what we have now is an asymptote that goes up this way, an asymptote that goes down this way, um, rule four and rule five, remember, um, as we sort of go up numerically through the rules, you just get a more uh, precise picture for what the root locus looks like. Rule four tells us how the branches depart, at what angle the branches depart from the poles. Um, and also it tells us at what angle do the branches that terminate at the zeros um, terminate at the zeros. And in this case, we only have two poles that are on the real axis. So because of rule two, I already know that the departure angle for the pole at P2, or the pole at negative one, I already know that that departure angle is zero degrees, because it's got to be going to the right, according to rule two. Um, on the flip side, I already know that the departure angle from P1 is 180 or pi. And I didn't have to compute rule four to determine that. I can just use sort of a combination of the previous rules. Okay, so again, rule four is one of those rules that we want to minimize the number of occurrences just because it's so tedious. Okay. Uh, rule five tells us break in breakout points, but I can see very clearly here that um, 
the break in the breakout point for these two branches is going to be right at alpha. Um, and even if that's not the case, it would occur somewhere between zero and negative one. And in this problem, it's not that critical because we just want to see if this controller is feasible. Okay, so what that means is that one branch is going to depart from the pole at the origin, meet at alpha, and then approach one of these asymptotes. It doesn't matter which one, because if one goes up, there's another one that's going down. Okay, so this is how one of the root locus branches is going to go. And the other one is going to meet along the real axis at the same point, but approach the other asymptote, like so. And of course, the direction of the branches is critical for root locus because that tells you which direction the closed loop poles are going to move as you increase the control parameter k. Okay, uh, remember that this root locus is for the controller c of s equals k. Okay, so we just have a proportional controller, and again, we're trying to see if a proportional controller will satisfy the design objectives for this problem. Okay, so this is our root locus. Back up here, this was a sketch of the desired pole region. Okay, so we need our closed loop poles to be in this orange shaded region. But what you can see is that this is actually how the closed loop poles will traverse throughout the S plane as a function of increasing K. So if we were to sketch or superimpose our desired pole region, uh, so negative three is here. If we were to sketch that desired pole region, we would find that basically for any value of k, for any value of k, the the root locus branches will never enter the desired pole region. Right? I mean, these are just vertical lines here. So as you increase k, the closed loop poles are just going to move further and further away from the real axis along those vertical lines. In other words, proportional control is, uh, is not feasible. Not feasible, okay? So it's not going to work. Um, and we only know that because we sketched the root locus and we were able to see that the, the closed loop poles are never going to enter the desired pole region, right? So this is one very powerful way we can use the concept of the root locus to actually start designing controllers, right? Uh, what we know now is that uh, proportional control will not work. Okay. I can actually verify some of this for you in MATLAB because in MATLAB there's a nifty little function called rlocus, which will actually sketch the root locus uh, for you for a given transfer function. Okay, so this cell of code, what this is going to do is just show us our desired pole region. So, right, so it's sort of the outermost boundary here, uh, which we determined analytically in our, our sketch prior to this. Um, but we can see here is that for um, proportional control, for the gain controller K, this becomes our L of S, which we determined analytically. And we can just check to see if our hand sketch agrees with the numerical um, counterpart in MATLAB. Okay. Superimposing the root locus on top of our desired pole region confirms exactly what we saw in our sketch. Right? These vertical branches, these are never going to enter this desired pole region here. And so for that reason, we can verify that, well, unfortunately, proportional control is not going to work. So the question becomes, well, what do we do about that exactly? Um, Maybe we shouldn't totally throw away this design here because what's really nice about this root locus picture is its shape, actually. It's a very desirable feature that these branches just kind of go vertically um, because what can happen in some cases is that the branches could actually bend or curve and sort of head off to the right. Um, and that's a problem because that would imply that for some value of k, you're your system could go unstable, right? Your, your closed loop poles uh, could potentially enter the right half plane for some large enough value of K. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that this shape of the root locus is actually desirable, 
it would be nice if we could sort of just move this shape, drag it you know, to the left, just pull that into the desired pole region. And if we could do that, then we could say, oh, for that particular controller, we can actually satisfy uh, the design objectives. One way to do that, one strategy for a control design is if if you like the shape of your root locus, but you want to translate it left or right, one good control form for doing that is to use something called a lead compensator. Okay, so this is basically proportional control, but you introduce a zero, and you also introduce a pole that's further to the left than that zero. Okay, by doing this, the goal here is to try and drag that root locus further to the left by essentially weighting the alpha further to the left, alpha being the point at which the asymptotes originate on the real axis. Okay, I'll show you what I mean in just a minute. Right? I'm not expecting you to understand exactly how this works yet, uh, but let's just assume we're going to try this controller and we'll see, um, we'll see where it goes. Okay, so for this controller, um, remember that the desired pole region doesn't change. However, the root locus will change. And for this controller, we again need to come up with the proper L of S uh, to sketch the root locus. And that always comes from plugging into the characteristic equation. So in this case, we've got 1 plus C, which is now this big um, function. So we've got K times s plus 1.01 .01 over s plus 8. That's our controller. Our plant hasn't changed. The plant is still 1 over s times s plus 1. But when we factor out that k, we find that we've got a new L of s. And that L of s is what, again, we're going to apply those rules of the root locus to. Okay, so for this L of s, it's important to keep things sort of in line here. Uh, let's, let's stay organized by writing down for this L of S things like N, which is a number of poles. In this case, we've got three poles. Okay, so it's now a third order denominator. We've introduced a zero, so there's uh, M, equal, M equals one now. What's nice here is that the uh, the term n minus m, that actually hasn't changed. That still equals 2. And that's what's going to preserve the overall shape of our previous root locus. In other words, one branch going up, one going down to infinity. Uh, the things that have changed here are the following. Okay, so maybe what we ought to do at this point is to sketch uh, sort of so far what our root locus kind of looks like. Uh, let me do this. Go way over here. Okay, so again, we've got our pole at the origin. There's a pole at negative one. But now, there's a zero right next to that pole, but slightly to the left. So there's a zero at negative 1.01. .01. Uh, and then there's this pole way over here at negative eight. Okay, so there's negative eight, minus one, minus 1.01 .01 is here. Okay, and that's the pole at the origin. So now I've got three poles and one zero. Now let's see what happens now when we go to compute um, alpha, which is going to be the point on the real axis where our two asymptotes begin. Okay, so alpha is equal to, again, it's the sum of all the poles, which in this case is going to be 0, minus 1, minus 8, minus the sum of all the zeros, which is there's 1 at negative 1.01 .01 now. All of that divided by n minus m, which is 2. And you can see that the minus 1 and the plus 1.01 .01 essentially cancel themselves out. And we have that alpha is basically minus 8 over 2. 
or negative 4. And that's sort of the key difference here, is that in the previous example, alpha was minus 1 half. So the asymptote started at negative 1 half. But by adding this additional pole in 0, and specifically having the pole be much further to the left than before, we've kind of dragged that alpha out further to the left. Okay, so alpha is now at negative 4. And because n minus m equals 2, theta 1 is still pi over 2, and theta 2 is still 3 pi over 2. Okay, so our asymptotes actually haven't changed. It's just that it's just that their point of origin has. Okay, so alpha has changed. Okay, so we've got asymptotes going up and down starting at alpha equals negative 4. What we ought to do next is to try and sketch in this root locus. Okay, so if we apply rule 2, hopefully by now you can see how the vertical line test works. So if we apply rule 2, we'll find that, again, everything between the pole at the origin and the pole at negative 1 should be uh, part of the root locus. The gap between, right, the, the tiny gap between the pole at negative 1 and the 0 at minus 1.01, that should not be part of the root locus, right? That little space on the real axis uh, should not be part of the root locus. However, everything to the left of the 0 at negative 1, continuing all the way to the pole at negative 8, all that part of the real axis should be considered part of the root locus. And then nothing to the left of the pole at negative 8, right? Because everything to the left of negative 8, uh, you would be to the left of 4 poles and zeros, right? When you add up all the poles and zeros, 4 is not an odd number, and therefore no part of the real axis to the left of negative 8 should be considered part of the root locus. Okay, So we've got some portion sketched in here. Uh, now what's interesting here is that, okay, if we look at sort of the, you know, what's going on here, you've got this region between the pole at the origin and the pole at negative 1, um, all sketched in. Uh, but this cannot represent one branch, right, because branches always depart from poles. Okay, so that green little area that we sketched, that actually has to represent two branches because there are two poles at the endpoints. So what that means is that one branch is going to be leaving the pole at the origin and heading to the left, and another branch is going to be leaving the pole at negative 1 and heading off to the right. So in the past, we've seen, in the last lecture, we've seen what happens here is that at some point those branches are going to meet and break away or break apart from the real axis. Okay, and that's called a breakout point, um, and that's what rule 5 is going to tell us. Uh, likewise, over here, we've got one branch leaving the pole at negative 8, and it's got to be heading off to the right according to rule 2. But at the same time, there's a, there's a branch that should be terminating at this 0, like so, but this orange branch and this blue branch can't be the same branch because at some point branches need to break apart and traverse along those asymptotes because, uh, as we know, two branches are going to approach infinity. Okay, so something interesting is going on here, and I think once we compute rule 5, it will be, uh, it will be more clear. Okay, so, so rule 5 says basically um, break and breakout points satisfy uh, essentially the quotient rule when applied to the numerator and denominator polynomials. Okay, so n of s, that's going to be sort of this s plus 1.01. d of s, that's going to be the third order polynomial when we expand out this denominator. Okay, and then rule 5, of course, says that n uh, times the derivative of d minus d times the derivative of with respect to s of n, that should equal 0. And solving for those values of s, we get minus 3.99, minus 1.12, and also minus 0 0.9.
Okay, so this is the key difference here from the previous examples that now we've got these break and breakout points and there's three of them that are valid, right? All three of these real values exist somewhere on the real axis that we know um, is part of the root locus according to rule two. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, we have to we have to kind of zoom in here. Okay, we've got to we've got to kind of zoom in to this very interesting region right here. And what I'll try and do is sketch sort of I'll sketch sort of a zoomed in region here, uh, like so. Okay, so right here we've got okay, we've got this portion of the real axis. Like so, we've got our pole at negative 1. Over here is our 0 at minus 1.01. 1. 0, 1. Um, and basically what we have is um, at, at this sort of end of this squiggle, we've got one branch that's heading off to the right. Like so. Is that right? Oh, I'm sorry, coming in from the right, like so. So this would be the sort of magenta branch coming in from the pole at the origin, okay? And then we've got our other branch starting at negative one and heading off to the right, okay? Uh, and then at the zero at negative 1.01, 1 .01, we've got a branch that's about to terminate there but we also have another branch that's going to be heading off to the left. That's going to sort of exit this region. Okay, now minus 1.12 falls just to the left of this zero. So right around here. So that's minus 1.12. And something happens there, right? Either branches break in or branches break out at that point. And based on our picture, it looks like two branches must break into the real axis at that point. Like so. Like so, okay? And then also at negative 0.9 right here, which is just to the right of the pole at negative 1, so there's negative 0.9. Branches either break in or break out of the real axis there as well. And according to our picture, based on the fact that the these are two branches that are coming in and essentially colliding with each other, negative 0.9 must represent a breakout point. So at this point here, one branch goes up. By the way, it's just a, a fact mathematically that break in breakout points always occur at 90 degrees to the real axis. Okay, so at this point, negative nine, negative point nine is deemed to be a breakout point. So this is what our branches kind of look like at this point. Now, the only way that this sort of magenta branch can connect up with this branch over here is if it sort of just takes a little detour around like so. Uh, this is precisely what happens when you introduce that zero really close to that pole. Okay, And due to rule zero, we have to maintain symmetry. So this other branch is just going to take a little, little detour around that area. Um, and now, so we're still consistent with rule two that says that this portion of the real axis here is not part of the real, uh, of, not part of the root locus. Okay. So this is kind of what's going on very, very zoomed in uh, to this region here, uh, right, right by this action at negative one. Okay, so this is a very zoomed in version. Okay, now if we scoot back up sort of to our main picture, what this implies is actually, okay, what this implies actually is that the branch coming in to the break in uh, the breakout point at negative 0.9, this guy is just going to take this little detour up this way, and then once it breaks back into the real axis, it's going to head towards the zero at negative 1.01. 1 .01.
at the same time, this branch that starts at the origin is going to break away, symmetrically take this little detour around into the complex area, break back into the real axis at negative 1.12, and head the opposite way. Right? That's what our zoomed in region here tells us. Okay. So what this means is now, finally, we've got this magenta branch heading towards our other break out point at negative, essentially negative 4, right, negative 3.99. And at that point, it's going to break away from the real axis and head along one of these asymptotes. Again, it doesn't matter which one. At the same time, this branch that started at negative 8, which has just been sort of slowly marching towards this break out point at negative 4, will meet and then head up the other asymptote, like so. Okay, so this becomes a complete root locus, right? This becomes a complete root locus for this updated controller, which is called a lead compensator, right? So just like sort of, um, just like we expected or just like we wanted to, what we've basically done is we've sort of taken that original shape with the two vertical branches going to infinity, but we've kind of drug it over to the left. And the idea behind that was to try, okay, so if this is negative four right here, then negative three falls somewhere here. And so our desired pole region drawn to scale on this root locus is something like this, which means all this space in here is now the desired pole region, right? That part actually hasn't changed. But now we see that our root locus branches are in that desired pole region for some value of k, right? Um, of course, what you might be thinking is, well, we introduced this uh, additional pole here at negative 8, and we introduced this 0 here at negative 1.01. Um, what that means is that there are now three branches, right, of the of the root locus because n is equal to three, um, and you can see that there's this blue branch, magenta, and orange branch. Uh, what we've done is we've effectively dragged the overall shape of the root locus into the desired pole region. So, for some value of k, you could presumably see that there would be uh, a pole, say here, along this orange branch. Uh, orange branch and a pole say here along this magenta branch but that also means that somewhere along this blue branch there's going to be another pole maybe here right um, and this pole right the one that's sort of on this little blue semicircular path that third pole is never going to enter the desired pole region so it may seem like we haven't solved the problem at all here uh, but if you think a little bit more carefully um, about why that's not going to be a big deal, um, you have to think back to you have to think back to why we place the zero at this particular point. Why did we place the zero so close to that pole at negative one? Okay, and the answer is, well, by doing it this way, this blue branch, right? So the blue branch here. The pole associated with this branch, no matter what k is, that pole is always going to be close to this 0 at negative 1. It's always going to be really, really close to that 0. And one of the things we learned about zeros in a previous lecture is that when a 0 is close to a pole, uh, the effect of that pole on the output is severely negated. Okay, so the closer the zero is to a pole, the less of an effect that that pole now has on the response. Okay, so even though there are now three closed loop poles, this pole here, which is always going to be close to the zero at negative 1.01, almost has no effect on the response at all. Okay, so it's almost as though these two poles along the orange and purple, uh, purple branch are the only... Uh, poles that have any effect on the response. Okay, so to answer the question about, okay, we introduced this, this third pole that will never actually enter the desired pole region. 
it doesn't really matter because that poll's really not going to have an effect on the response because it's so close to that additional zero that we introduce. So what I can show you now back in MATLAB is actually the effect of that update in our control. Okay, so recall for the previous controller where we just had proportional control, we saw that the root locus branches, right, these two blue and green branches, would never enter the desired poll region. If we go ahead and update our controller, right, so this is that poll at negative 8 and the 0 at negative 1.01, we found that our L of S changed. And of course, if our L of S changes, our root locus changes. And the root locus changes precisely the way that we sketched it in our in our picture over here. You can even see, again, so our, our pole boundary hasn't changed. And now you see two of the branches prominently within that pole boundary. But you also see this kind of funny business going on near negative one. Now, if we go ahead and zoom in on that area, really far, by the way, because we placed that zero so close to the pole, we can see exactly what we saw over on our hand sketch, is that is that basically there's a breakout point at about negative 0.9 and a break-in point at negative 1.12. And so to preserve that little gap between negative 1 and negative 1.01, the branches actually split apart and go sort of circularly around that region. Um, what you may notice is that the way that I sketched it here, uh, the way that we sketched it on our drawing had the branch leaving from negative 1, traversing around, and then heading towards a 0 at negative 1.01. The MATLAB chose to have that branch go the other way, but again, it doesn't matter because if there's one branch pointing to the left, by definition, there's always another branch pointing to the right. So right, the poles don't actually disappear or you know there's always going to be three poles somewhere along those three branches so the particular you know direction that one branch chooses after a break in or breakout point it doesn't really matter okay so what you're seeing here is basically that little semicircular region that we sketched out and if we zoom all the way back out you can see that really if we put things into perspective then some pole right along that blue branch is always going to be so close to that zero at negative 1.01, it's never going to make an effect on the response. And really just the two poles associated with this red and green branch, those are going to be the only poles that um, contribute to the response. And we can see that for some critical value of k, some range of k values, we will have our two poles very comfortably within that desired pole region. Okay? Okay, so this is the first example. Uh, this entire lecture is basically just two examples. Okay, so the first example, you know, took us through this idea of how do we apply the root locus concept to do control design. Uh, we tried one controller which failed, and we were only able to determine that it failed because we sort of superimposed the root locus on top of the desired pole region. Um, proportional control doesn't work, so our motivation was then try to drag that root locus. Uh, to the left so that it's more comfortably in our desired pole region. And one way to do that was through what's called a, a lead controller, which is what we did here. We introduced a zero uh, and a pole further to the left of that zero. And the overall effect of that was to sort of drag that root locus picture uh, into a more desirable uh, region. Okay, So this is our first design example. Um, understand we incorporated a lot of things from past lectures, but, but that's good. Right? We're at the point in the term where we can start using these design tools, using the analysis tools that we learned previously, and sort of combining them to do some very uh, interesting control design. All right, so the second example we'll look at for this lecture uh, has to do less with the transient response and more with steady state response. Okay, so here is a plant, uh, s plus 2 over s squared plus s plus 3. And if we look at the open loop step response, right, that's what this is here, we can see that the steady state value is something like 2 thirds, right? It's about 0.6667, right? Um, what we're trying to do with the step response is track a value of 1. Okay, so our steady state error here. Uh, 
is basically one third. We're always going to be 33% um, off from our desired set point. Um, and that's a problem, right? Especially if you're doing some precise control design, you want to be able to track a step reference perfectly. Okay, so this motivates the need to close the loop and design some control system so that this steady state value matches um, the, the reference step of, of one. Okay? Uh, so what we want to do basically is to choose a controller that would get this blue line as close as possible to that red line. Um, one of the controllers that we learn is good for improving steady state response is of course the integral controller. Okay, so the integral controller has the form of k over s. And so because of our design motivation, right, we want to improve the tracking capability, uh, we want to try a controller that is supposed to improve that, that, that steady state response. So we're going to try integral control. Um, and the plant here was s plus 2 over s squared plus s plus 3. And again, what we're trying to do is improve that steady state performance. One of the things that we found with integral control is that you've always got to be careful um, because integral control, just due to its nature, um, can sometimes have the undesired effect of producing instability. Okay, so we, you know, we always want to avoid uh, going unstable at all costs. So it's very important that if we're going to use an integral controller like this to do some analysis to make sure it's not going to go unstable, um, or if it is going to go unstable, when is it going to go unstable? So that's what we're going to work on in this example. Um, what we want to do, of course, right, is we want to look at the root locus. Right? If we're using the root locus idea to do control design, uh, sketching the root locus gives us a great picture sort of of how those closed loop poles are going to uh, move around in the S-plane, okay? uh, which means that we're going to just jump right in and start sketching our root locus. Always start by looking at the characteristic equation and plugging in what we have. All right, so we're going to try k over s. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor the k. Uh, and then I'm going to absorb that into the plant. So we've got s plus 2 over s times s squared plus s plus 3. If I write the characteristic function this way, it's very clear what my L of S is, right? It's all this other stuff once I factor out the K here. So now I've got it in the proper form. Uh, and now that I have it in the proper form, I can start applying those rules of the root locus, okay? Uh, let's see. So for this example, we've got L of S is equal to S plus two over S times s squared plus s plus 3. Uh, there are three poles. There is one zero. So again, we have the case where n minus m equals 2. So whenever you see this, n minus m equals 2, you kind of should already have a general a general image of what the root locus will look like. In, in as much as you're going to have one branch that goes vertically to infinity, and another branch that goes downward vertically at uh, to infinity, right? So having that parameter n minus m in your head will help as you sketch the root locus here. Um, like I said, it's, it's always important to label what you've got. So I've got one pole at the origin. I've got another pole at uh, minus one half plus root 11 over 2j, and that's just by applying the quadratic function to this um, s squared plus s plus 3. And I have another pole at minus 1 half minus root 11 over 2j, because complex poles always come in conjugate pairs. And then, of course, I have 1, 0 at negative 2. Okay, so one of the first things you always want to do when sketching a root locus is plot your poles and zeros of your L of S. Okay, so plotting these poles and zeros, I see 
Well, I've got a pull at the origin. I've got a zero at negative two. And I've got poles at plus and minus, uh, minus one half plus or minus root 11 over 2j. So I've got poles here, here, one at the origin, and then the zero over here. Okay. Uh, according to according to rule two, the portion of the real axis that I uh, know to be on the root locus ought to be everything between the pole at the origin and the zero at negative two. Right. Again, just imagine applying the vertical line test, and at any point along this shaded region, you are always going to be to the left of an odd number of poles and zeros. Uh, let's see, n minus m equals 2. So according to rule 1, two of the branches are going to approach infinity, uh, and one of the branches should approach the 0 at negative uh, 2. Okay, so what we want to do is figure out, using rule 3, how those branches that approach infinity are going to go to infinity. Um, because n minus m equals 2, we already know theta 1 and theta 2 are given by pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. I just plug into the equation. The difference here, of course, is alpha, right? So alpha we get by adding up all the poles, subtracting from that the sum of all the zeros, and then dividing by n minus m. Um, and if you do this correctly, alpha is always going to come out to be a real value because the complex portion or the imaginary portion of the complex pole should always cancel themselves out. Okay, so I get that alpha equals positive one half, which is over here. Uh, anytime you have a positive value for alpha and n minus m equals two, uh, well, you should be a little bit concerned because what that means is that your branches are going to approach asymptotes that are in the right half plane, right? Which can imply instability for some some critical value of k. Okay. Um, what I also know from uh, what I also know from this problem, and we're skipping a little bit of the math here because this example is more about the control design rather than sketching the root locus. But if I were to have applied rule five, I would have found that there are uh, solutions to rule five at negative 3.17 and also negative 0.17 plus or minus 0.96j. And so I would have actually computed rule five and gotten these solutions for s. But remember, it's always up to you to determine which of these values are feasible and legitimate break in breakout points. For example, uh, any complex values you get as a solution of rule, rule 5, you can throw away because, of course, branches cannot break in or break out of the real axis at a complex location. It just doesn't make sense. Um, also, real values, you always have to check carefully, right? You may assume that because the minus 3.17 is a real value that it's got to be a valid root, uh, a valid break-in or break-out point, but according to rule 2, you see that no portion of the real axis outside of the range from 0 to negative 2 is actually part of the root locus. So there will never be an actual break-in break-out point that occurs way out here at minus you know, 3.17 because there's no root locus there on the real axis, okay? So that means we can throw these away and there are no, um, there are no feasible or legitimate break-in breakout points. And what that means, right, what that implies for this um, root locus plot is actually the shaded region, according to rule two, this is actually an entire branch, right? So the branch that leaves a pole at the origin just kind of heads off to the left. It never breaks in or breaks out of the real axis, and it just heads straight to the zero at negative two. <clears throat> um, what we know is that there's these other two branches, and so we're just going to leave, we're going to forget about rule four for now because, um, well, it takes a long time, and also 
we don't really care. We don't care for the moment how the branches depart from these poles. All we care about for now is that they ultimately approach these asymptotes. And these asymptotes are in the right half plane. And that is sort of the essence of this problem is, well, we've got ourselves an issue now, right? Right? By, by applying this integral controller, right? By applying this controller, we're aiming to improve our tracking of the original step function, right? We're trying to get perfect tracking, but what we've done is we've created a scenario where for some critical value of k, right? For some critical value of k, we can see that our closed loop poles are actually going to go from the left half plane into the right half plane, thereby destabilizing our system, right? So this is one of the problems, again, with integral control. It's coming up again. Uh, we're seeing it from the standpoint of the root locus, okay? So the point of this problem is not just to illustrate this idea that, oh, there's now a problem. The point actually of this problem is to figure out, well, what is that critical value of k? How do we find Right? Remember, if k is small, you know, the closed loop poles are going to be just barely traversing along these branches. But as k gets larger and larger, as k gets larger and larger, well, this pole over here, this is going to be just fine. That's just heading off into the left half plane further. But these two poles will eventually traverse into the right half plane. Right? So that's the problem with using integral control, is that if this k here gets too large, then we've got ourselves a problem, and we need to figure out what that critical value of k is, okay? So that's what the remainder of this problem is going to be, is how to solve for that critical value of k. Uh, in, order to, in order to figure that out, okay, what we're going to do is kind of step through a little bit of a, sort of this like logical progression, because it's actually somewhat counterintuitive how to solve for that that critical value, okay? Um, so let, let's start with a couple of statements here. We'll, we'll just start at the definition. Right? Basically, the, the fundamental definition of root locus is that the value s is on the root locus if this equation is satisfied. That's how we got uh, essentially the picture of the root locus, okay? Um, here's another fact. Uh, remember, S is any complex value, right? S is some value that exists in the complex domain, so it's got a real component and an imaginary component. Um, if S is equal to J omega, in other words, if there is no real component but only an imaginary component, then the value of s is on the imaginary axis. And we call that, uh, we call that the stability boundary. Right? So s equals j omega, there's no real component. That is right there on the stability boundary. Okay, so if we were to combine these two, it stands to reason that uh, one plus k, L of j omega, right? You plug in j omega for s, that equation should be satisfied at the stability boundary. Boundary. And so that's kind of the key to this, uh, the subsequent analytical approach to finding that critical k is to realize that this is satisfied at the imaginary axis, okay? If we rearrange this just a little bit and we solve for k, we find that k should be equal to minus 1 over L of j omega, right? Uh, well, here's a fact. k is a real value, right? k is just, k is just a number. It's just a gain or a voltage or a current that we're going to be using to represent the uh, control, the, the control parameter. Uh, this is an equation, right, equals, on the right-hand side, negative 1 is a real value, right? So 
real on the left side better equal real on the right side. However, L of j omega in general is a complex valued function. Right? It's just a mathematically this function exists in the complex domain. However, in order to preserve this equality, at the stability boundary, L of j omega must also be real, such that you know, real equals real over real. It's the only way this equation uh, could be true. And if L of j omega must be real at the stability boundary, that implies that the imaginary component of L of j omega must be zero, right? That's what this implies. Okay, so this is the actual, this is the actual sort of actionable item that you're going to, to use to compute the critical value, but it's important to understand where this comes from because it's actually rather counterintuitive. Okay, so essentially the first step is to compute L of j omega, right? You need to compute that, that complex valued function. Um, second thing you're going to do is set the imaginary part of L of j omega equal to zero. And what that's going to do is that's going to yield an omega critical, right? So you're actually going to be solving for some omega value such that this equation holds true. And what that is physically is, right, remember omega is sort of the distance along the imaginary axis. Solving for omega critical gives you this distance from the origin to that critical point where that uh, root locus branch crosses the imaginary axis. Right, so setting the imaginary part of L of j omega allows you to solve for that omega critical. And of course, in order to find the k critical, you've got to now back substitute into this equation. Okay, so k critical is equal to minus 1 over L of j omega, where omega is the critical value that you previously computed. So this is sort of the process for finding the critical value of k. And you got to remember that it's just a bit counterintuitive. Um, and I mentioned that because, oops, I mentioned that because if you look at the, sorry, I got to scroll all the way down here. If you look at this point on the imaginary axis, you might, you might be inclined to say, well, I should set the, I should set the real component of that value equal to zero to solve for that imaginary axis crossing. The reason that's not the case, okay, the reason that's not the case is the following. The root locus, okay, the root locus, this is a plot of closed loop poles, right? It's a plot of closed loop poles. It is not a plot of L of s or L of j omega, right? It's not a plot of L of s, and that's the key here, right? If it were a plot of L of s, then it would make sense to set the real part equal to zero and solve for that imaginary axis crossing. But we, in order to find that critical value of k, we're sort of taking this sort of backdoor approach where we're going through the L of j omega uh, complex valued function in order to find the critical value of omega. So it's strange, but you ultimately set the imaginary part of L of j omega equal to zero to find the, the critical value or the imaginary axis crossing on the root locus itself. So a little bit strange. Okay? So I just want to try and clarify that now. Uh, in practice, this is a whole different story. Okay? So in practice, once you understand this process, there's a whole other piece of the puzzle which is actually applying it, which, which can be a, a bit tricky. Okay. Um, so let's just start and see, see if we can make it through this example. We start with L of S, our original L of S for the problem, which was, which was S plus 2 over S times S squared plus S plus 3. Uh, immediately what we want to do is to substitute uh, S uh, substitute j omega for s, which would give us the function of L of j omega. So essentially, everywhere you see s, you just plug in j omega. Like so. Okay. 
Now, immediately what happens is that right, this now becomes a complex valued function. Right, this becomes a complex valued function. Right, there's j's and omegas and, and constant values without, without j. So it's a real and imaginary component to this complex valued function. What we'd like to do is to be able to write this as one real component plus some imaginary component. We'd like to split up this complex value into its real and imaginary counterpart. Um, the reason we want to do that is because ultimately we want, it, we want to set this equal to zero to solve for omega critical. Okay? Uh, one way to write a messy complex function like this in terms of real plus imaginary is to conjugate. Right? So try to get a real value denominator which we can get by multiplying top and bottom by complex conjugates, and then sort of separate out the numerator into real and imaginary components. Okay, so one way to do this, okay, for the denominator at least, sometimes it's easier to rewrite. So I'd prefer to write j omega as omega j. Um, j omega squared, right, this quantity here, j omega squared is actually negative omega squared, right? It's actually a real value. So I'm going to lump that together with 3, which is another real value. And so I'll get 3 minus omega squared plus this imaginary component, which is omega j, like so. So writing it this way, it becomes a little bit easier to conjugate because the complex conjugate of omega j that's minus omega j. And the complex conjugate of this big thing is, well, just keep it in terms of this real and imaginary form. It should just be 3 minus omega squared, which is a real component, minus omega j. Okay, so this would be the complex conjugate of this big thing over here. And in order to preserve the equation, to multiply it by uh, multiply top and bottom like so. Okay, so we can at least handle the denominator first, right? Omega j times negative omega j. Okay, omega j times negative omega j, that's just omega squared, which is a real value, which is nice. That's what we're attempting to do here, is to create a real value denominator. Uh, this big bracketed term times its complex conjugate, which is this big bracketed term, let's just leave it symbolically. So real, right, the form is real squared plus imaginary squared. So this entire term is going to look like 3 minus omega squared squared plus the imaginary component, which is omega squared, right? But the, the j, the imaginary component j actually goes away, right? And because they're complex conjugates, those cross terms also go away. So this entire denominator is now real valued. What's left to do is to basically sort out this numerator. Right? So the numerator, there's no, there's no tricks there. You just kind of have to brute force expand the whole thing out and collect the real stuff and separate it from all of the imaginary stuff. Um, and ultimately, what we're going to get, well, is um, is the following. So cleaning up our denominator a little bit, you can write it in a slightly different form, but it's equivalent to what we had above. Writing it this way is a little bit more clear. And so this will be our real component, this will be our imaginary component. Like so. This is all the imaginary stuff over here. All the real stuff was 
there's a couple terms here. And so all of this stuff was the real components. And then over here is a collection of all the imaginary components of the numerator. Oops. Like so. So at the end of the day, we have L of j omega written as real plus imaginary. And this is what we want, really. This is ultimately what we want here. Um, because, like I said, to find that critical value of k, we got to take the imaginary part here, set it equal to 0 to solve for our critical value of omega. Okay, so doing so, take the imaginary part of L of j omega, set it equal to 0. This part of the computation requires taking this over here, setting it equal to 0. Okay. If we set this equal to 0, you can see right away, you can multiply both sides of the equation by uh, the denominator and this negative as well. So the imaginary part of L of j omega equal to 0, that really just boils down to taking the numerator of the imaginary component, setting it equal to 0, and solving for omega. Okay. So these are going to give us critical values for omega. If we solve here, we get 0 and plus and minus root 6. Okay, so these are critical values for omega. These are all the places where the root locus should be crossing the imaginary axis, right? These are root locus imaginary axis crossings. Theoretically, this is all the locations where that occurs. So if we look back up kind of quickly at our initial root locus sketch, we should see three locations. There's one, zero, right? Omega equals zero. That's the one at the origin. We're not interested in that one. We're interested in the ones here at plus and minus root six. Okay, so this value here, that value, that's root six. And then down here, that's negative root six. So our three critical values for omega are 0 and plus and minus root 6, which agrees, thankfully, with our uh, root locus plot. So it's up to you to determine, right, which one do we need to choose to find our critical k value. And based on our picture, it's pretty clear that we want to choose either the root 6 or the negative root 6. Uh, we should get the same result using either one. Um, again, to figure out the critical value of k, we actually need to compute k critical is minus 1 over L of j omega critical. That's how we're going to get the critical k value. Okay, um, L of j omega critical, if we choose root 6, is going to be L of j times root 6, which unfortunately means plugging in, right? we've got to back substitute root 6 everywhere we see omega in the L of j omega equation. Now I understand that sounds pretty terrible, but notice that we don't need to plug it in anywhere into the imaginary component, because by definition, if we plug in root 6 here, we'll get 0. Right? That's how we solved for root 6, is by setting this component equal to 0. So thankfully, half of our workload is done for us, and we really just need to plug root 6 back into the real component of L of j omega. When we do that, you plug in uh, root 6 really just into this component here, right? What we end up with is that L of j times root 6 equals minus 1 third. Okay, so I'll spare you some of the algebra there. All I did was literally plug in root 6 everywhere I saw an omega here and simplify it as best I could. Okay, so I got minus 1 third. Still, that's not the critical value, right? So k critical is equal to minus 1 divided by that, which by my calculation works out to 3. Okay, So a lot of work to get a value of 3. However, we're still not really finished, because this just tells you the critical value for where the root locus branches are going to cross the imaginary axis. But conceivably, there are a couple of scenarios. It's possible to have a case where the root locus branch is going this way, right? So starting in the right half plane and entering into the left half plane, this would imply a range of k 
that k needs to be greater than 3, such that you place your closed loop poles in the left half plane. In our case, however, we found that our two branches are actually starting in the left half plane and then entering into the right half plane. So this picture of the root locus implies that the range of k is actually that k must be less than 3. Right? So even, even after you compute that critical value of k, you still have to cross-reference that value against your original root locus uh, sketch to figure out what the range of k would be for uh, closed loop stability, okay? What we can do here is we can actually just verify this. Let's just double check that we didn't screw up the algebra by going back over to MATLAB. Okay, and the very last thing we'll do over here is to verify that our uh, sort of root locus analysis uh, works. Okay, so back to our original example here. Uh, remember that this was the open loop step response. So we were uh, we were motivated to use closed loop control because this wasn't doing a very good job tracking. Okay, so to close the loop in MATLAB is relatively easy. You define your controller. Uh, well, actually, you define your gain k. Then you define the controller k over s. So this is an integral controller. Define the closed loop transfer function g, and then we're just going to look at the uh, closed loop um, step response as well as the closed loop poles. Okay, so. We said that basically, right, based on our analysis, um, for, for closed loop stability, we basically want zero, we want k to be within the range of zero to three, right? Anything larger than three, we found that our, uh, two of our closed loop poles will enter the right half plane. So we can start with the value of k equals one, for example, and look at the, look at the response here Okay, so what I have here is actually an image of uh, a couple of things. On the right-hand side, it's a closed loop response, which is ultimately what we were trying to do. Remember, we were trying to track this step reference of one perfectly, and so using integral control, we've actually achieved that. Right? We've actually achieved perfect tracking here. Uh, and what you're seeing over here is a couple of things as well. You're seeing the root locus plot, right? the green, red, and blue branches, uh, which we were able to sketch uh, by hand, but you're also seeing the actual location of the closed loop poles for that value of k. Right, so when k is equal to 1, the actual closed loop poles are here uh, at these pink x's along those root locus branches. If I increase k, right, these two complex poles should move to the right along those branches, and this pole on the real axis should move to the left. Okay? So let's see if let's see what happens if we increase k to two. Okay, so indeed the two complex poles inched closer to the imaginary axis, while the real pole sort of moved further to the left, and the result of all three of those closed loop poles uh, changes the closed loop step response to look like this. Okay, so technically we're still tracking perfectly. Once all this transient behavior dies out, we will be tracking a value of one. Um, and it makes sense that we're starting to get more oscillations because these two complex poles, they're getting closer to uh, the imaginary axis. So our damping ratio is sort of shrinking, okay? Um, our critical value for K, which we found analytically, was three, okay? At a value of three, what you should suspect would happen is that those two complex poles would now be exactly on the imaginary axis. And if we have poles on the imaginary axis that are not repeated, we should expect uh, marginal, marginally stable behavior. And so let's see what happens when k is actually equal to the critical value of k. Okay, so indeed we get, okay, this is not just a block of blue, this is actually, okay, it's actually a sinusoidal function centered around value one, but it never decays. So this is marginally stable behavior. And that's no surprise because two of our poles are exactly on their imaginary axis. Okay? Of course, if we choose any value of k just slightly larger than that critical value, we should go unstable, which is the case uh, here. You're seeing that the closed loop step response goes unstable. Uh, and that's, of course, because these two complex poles have been just barely pushed into the right half plane. Okay? Uh, to see this more dramatically, uh, 
if we just make k equal to something larger, you can see that definitely that these two poles have been pushed substantially into the right half plane, and thereby we still have a, an unstable response. Okay, so this is a pretty heavy lecture. Um, you can hopefully see why I split up the root locus um, sketching component and the root locus control design uh, component into two separate lectures. Um, what we did in today's lecture is basically applied the root locus concept to doing a couple of um, pretty legitimate control design examples. Okay, so the first example was sort of doing a feasibility study and trying to manipulate the root locus to fit where you want it to. Um, and then the second example was to find these critical k values. So you now know how to solve for the value of k such that um, it's right at the point when the root locus is crossing the imaginary axis, which is going to come up again and again as you go through more and more control design problems. Okay, um, You'll have an assignment based on uh, root locus design methods, which will give you some practice um, doing these um, uh, developing these skills in control design. And then uh, after that, we're going to jump into something new. We'll jump into frequency response, and we'll pick up our last and final control design tool, which is going to be um, Nyquist stability criterion. Okay, so we'll see you in the next one.